And so everybody wrote the story. And once they wrote the story, then this tapped into the whole sort of jealousy of the nation when people said, well, then people had no idea that these guys had stolen so much. Um, and many, many more stories. There's probably been a thousand stories written about that one piece of research. And uh, on the back of that, parliamentary debates began, board of director debates began, um, minority shareholder debates began. And on the back of that, Putin stepped in um, about eight or nine months after we started this whole process. And he fired the CEO of Gazprom and replaced him with a guy whose job it was to not steal any more assets. <laughs> and the share price doubled. And then it doubled again. And then doubled again. The Gazprom share price went up a hundred times. Not a hundred percent, a hundred times. And this is, this, is, this is like the largest company in the world. This is not, we're not talking about a hundred times. And it was my largest investment. Well, as you can imagine, I felt pretty enthusiastic about this process of investing. I wanted more things to do. So I went after the electricity company. We went after the National Savings Bank. We went after three, oil, three different oil companies, a chocolate company, a pipeline company. And amazingly, more or less every time we did something, we had success. Not, not huge success, but, um, uh, but success. And um, the, um, uh, the success was um, uh, very much part of this um, uh, strange political situation that was going on in Russia, which was that um, uh, Putin was fighting with the same guys that we were fighting with. He was fighting with the oligarchs who were stealing power from him, and we were fighting with the oligarchs who were stealing money from us, and so he would step in and, and do stuff, not because um, it was the right thing to do, he would step in and do stuff because it was um, your enemy's enemy is your friend. And so we did this just beautifully uh, for four years until 2003. And then in 2003, something happened which changed my life forever, which was the arrest of the richest man in Russia, Michael Hordakovsky. He was arrested on, in October of 2003 on the runway in Siberia. And after he was arrested, um, everybody else in Russia said, if the richest guy in Russia can, go, can be arrested, and what about us? And one by one by one, the rest of the oligarchs in Russia went back to Putin and said, how do we make sure we don't get arrested? And Putin said, talk to so-and-so. And so-and-so -and -so said, here's some wiring instructions. <laughs> and um, one by one by one, Every oligarch became not an adverse to the Kremlin, but friendly to the Kremlin in a very material way. And I was still doing my naming and shaming campaign. And I was no longer a friend of the regime. I was no longer useful to their system. I was ab absolutely adverse to their whole situation. And um, on November 13, 2005, as I was flying back from Moscow, I fly back from London to Moscow, where I'd lived. And I, at this point, I'd lived in the country for 10 years. I was managing four and a half billion dollars in the Russian equity market. I was the largest foreign investor in the country. And I, I had sort of considered myself to be a friend of the country because I'd been doing all this stuff to uh, clean up Russia. I was stopped at the airport. I was arrested, put in detention. Um, they kept me there for 24 hours. They then um, stamped my passport, annulled my visa, put me on a plane back to London, and declared me a threat to national security, never to be allowed back into Russia again. Well, at the time, I felt like this was the biggest punishment you could ever um, give a person. I didn't realize how lucky I was. Um, but at, at, uh, sort of moments after, or, or weeks and months after I was kicked out, um, my clients said, um, that's been really a fun ride with you, Bill, um, but we'd like our money back. 
and they basically all withdrew their money from my fund, which felt like a terrible thing because that's what you do. And as a fund manager, you manage other people's money. If you don't have it, then you don't manage their money. You have no business. And um, uh, and so I um, uh, sold all of my securities in Russia, four and a half billion dollars worth of securities um, over the next year, which and gave my clients their money back, which turned out to be a very lucky thing for my clients because I'll tell you what happened next. So I, so I move all the money out, and at that point I also move all of my employees out. I take all of my staff and move them to London, other than um, uh, a secretary and, and sort of a rotating person that went through the office from, from abroad. And 18 months after I was kicked out, on June 4, 2007, 25 police officers from the Moscow Economics Crimes Department at the Interior Ministry raid my office. 25 more officers raid the office of my American law firm, Firestone Duncan. And their raids are specifically looking for the certificates, articles of association, stamps, and seals from the three investment holding companies through which we had made all of our investments in Russia. We didn't know what they wanted with the documents, um, but it turned out three months later that we no longer owned our companies. The documents had been used to re-register the companies into the name of a man who, had been, who was convicted of murder, let out of jail after two years to put his name on these documents for the Interior Ministry. So we no longer owned our companies. And at that point, we went out and hired seven lawyers from four different law firms to help us unravel this horrible mess. And there was one particular lawyer who headed the investigation of what was going on. He was a 36-year-old man named Sergei Magnitsky. He worked for this American law firm, Firestone Duncan. And Sergei led the investigation. He came back to us and he said, this is far worse than, than you can imagine. He said, not only have your companies been stolen, but the documents that were taken during the raid were used to fake a bunch of backdated contracts to claim that your companies owed a billion dollars um, to three newly formed shell companies. And then they took these contracts to court. The newly formed shell companies sued your companies, and the people who stole your companies hired lawyers to defend your companies from these lawsuits, but then instructed the lawyers to plead guilty the moment they got to court. So as a result of five-minute hearings, the court authorized a billion dollars of court-sanctioned liabilities against our three companies. Immediately after that, the police raided all of our banks looking for assets so they could use them to, to seize the assets from these judgments. Thank God there were no assets there because my clients had all taken their money out. And I thought that was the uh, sort of ugly but sort of close brush with badness, but I didn't realize what they had planned next. The next thing these guys did was they, our, our companies had been enormously profitable. We paid a billion, we had a billion dollars of profits in 2006 that we reported to the tax authorities, and we paid $230 million of taxes. They went to the tax authorities with the stolen companies, and they said these tax payments last year were a big mistake. Look, here's a billion dollars of court authorized liabilities. So in fact, they, the companies didn't make a billion dollars, they were break even. Therefore, we would like to have $230 million in taxes that was overpaid and refunded. They applied for a tax refund on December 23rd, 2007. It was granted, the largest tax refund in Russian history was granted on the 24th of December, 2007. One day later, no questions asked paid out to a small bank owned by a man convicted of fraud two years earlier. At this point, we were truly appalled. I mean, I mean it's one thing, I mean, it's just truly unbelievable. Um, when we discovered this, we, we then filed criminal complaints with every major law enforcement agency in Russia. The criminal complaints um, one would have expected since we were reporting the theft of a quarter of a billion dollars of state funds, you'd have expected the next day SWAT teams and helicopters to be surrounding the criminals and arresting them, rounding them all up, because their names were named in all these documents. Well, there were SWAT teams and helicopters, but they weren't going after the guys who did this. They opened up criminal cases against all seven of our lawyers from four different law firms. 
The moment that I heard this, I got on the phone with each of them and I said, it's time to leave, now. Nobody wanted to leave, you know. Can you imagine if I called any of you up and said, time to leave right now, 15 minutes, get your bags packed. But six of the seven lawyers left. But one of them refused to go, it was Sergei Magnitsky. He was about 10 years younger, he was in his mid-30s, 10 years younger than the other lawyers. And he hadn't experienced in his adult life the capriciousness of the Soviet era. He didn't know what it was capable of. And he said, I've not done anything wrong. I'm not going to leave. 